so it's a pleasure to have uh, uh, Professor Ritika Mhiri giving a webinar. I hope she'll visit us one day. Um, Aditi did her PhD from IIC Bangalore um, in, I think, 2005 or something uh, um, in uh, the group of Manju Bansal. And then she spent some time as a postdoc in uh, Berlin with Martin Wingrup. And then she was a research associate at UCL uh, London for a while. And then she has been a PI at University of Birmingham and now at University of Liverpool. And at that time, she has worked on quite a variety of systems from uh, protein DNA interactions uh, to DNA um, bendability to regulatory genomics to. Um, so now she's uh, currently working a lot on non coding RNAs and their role in biology, which is beginning to get understood now. Um, so without further ado, I'll take it over to you. Um, and, um, if you want to, anyone wants to ask questions during the talk, please raise your hand or type in the chat box. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, Rahul, uh, for invitation. Uh, I, I, I mean, um, as I said, I started as a computational biology and uh, I have digressed a bit. So I, I, this is after a long time giving a talk in the computational biology department. So I'm quite looking forward to it. Um, and. Uh, if um, please um, feel free to stop me in between if you want. Um, if you have any questions, um, I, I, I will. I can stop and explain. So my lab is uh, interested in uh, epigen epigenetics and role of non-coding RNAs in epigenetics. And as most of you might know, uh, that in eukaryotic cell, the human genome. Um, is basically uh, wound around histones um, to form heterochromatin and open chromatin. And um, uh, the heterochromatin is decided by how tightly um, the uh, DNA is wound around histones. And in some places where the, um, the chromatin is loosely wound, is we commonly called open chromatin. And on top of this, um, most, sorry, my, um, this thing is, so um, these histones are chemically modified um, and um, these histone modifications are quite important in determining which part of the genome um, um, becomes heterochromatic and which part of the genome becomes open chromatin. And in addition to histone modifications or chemical modifications of histones, there is also um, DNA methylation. So DNA also um, gets chemically modified uh, such that a methyl group is added to cytosine. And uh, this modification is also quite important in um, determining how the chromatin uh, which which region of the DNA, DNA becomes heterochromatic and which region becomes is open chromatin, and um, that's why these um, uh, and together DNA methylation and histone modification um, we we call them uh, as epigenetic modifications, and together um, they are quite important in. Um, uh, gene determining gene expression pattern in cells. So, um, for example, uh, there are certain histone modifications which are repressive, um, which which lead to formation of heterochromatin. And if there are genes that are sitting in those regions, uh, they will they are generally switched off. Genes which are um, present in open chromatin or euchromatin are um, generally um, uh, generally express. So the, because these histone modification, these epigenetic modifications influence uh, heterochromatin and open chromatin formation, they also influence uh, the gene expression patterns in the cell. So that's why they are quite important. But what happens in many diseases is this pattern is, uh, is, um, uh, is disturbed 
And uh, where you shouldn't see repressive histone modification, you start seeing uh, repressive histone modifications. And where you shouldn't see open um, uh, modification related to open chromatin, you start seeing them. And that really disturbs the chromatin uh, uh, regulation. Uh, and as a result, lot of, there are many, um, um, there are disturbances in gene expression pattern. And that's the reason why um, these epigenetic modifications are becoming quite important in biology. Um, so we, for many years, people have been studying the, these epigenetic modifications and we uh, now understand which modifications are repressive and which modifications are, um, which, uh, are correlated to high, high gene expression. So um, as a result, a lot of epigenetic drugs have also been, um, now uh, people are trying to design epigenetic drugs. There are few in market and there are some in clinical trials. But what, so what these epigenetic drugs do is they try to um, uh, wipe out these, um, more, try to correct these um, disturbances in diseases, epi uh, disturbances in epigenetic modification in diseases. Uh, but the issue is these drugs are uh, what they call, these are pan drugs. So they try to erase um, the um, aberrant histone modifications. But if you want to design um, drugs which are really- um, uh, uh, can yeah. I ask you a question? So before you yeah. go to these, uh, these other things, so typically when people talk about open uh, chromatin uh, versus uh, heterochromatin, so like what's the, what's the um, like how do you define quantitatively what is like tightly packed and what is loosely packed? Like uh, this kind of, you said that, that they're tightly bound to this, uh, the DNA is more tightly bound to the Heterochrom I mean, uh, to the uh, histones in the heterochromatin region compared mm -hmm. to the open chromatin region. So how do people typically quantify this? Like, how do you know if you have a piece of DNA? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I understood. Um, so uh, I, 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 I cannot tell you how quantitatively uh, it can be measured, but traditionally the way uh, people um, found out about heterochromatin and euchromatin was through uh, staining. So there are, uh, you might have seen these pictures of um, um, uh, microscopy images where if you stain DNA, uh, generally you will see, see this uh, dense regions, um, highly uh, stained regions, and then lightly stained regions in case of, I think a lot of these initial uh, studies were on Drosophila. Um, and uh, also there are um, other measures like DNS1 hypersensitivity. Um, so basically, uh, if you try to um, uh, chop off the DNA using enzymes, then because open chromatin is more accessible, you start seeing um, uh, it, it, it gets chopped off quite easily, basically. But I don't know... Um, it's a good point, actually. I don't know if there is a quantitative measure uh, of the distances between the nucleosomes. Um, but I mean, from experimental point of view, we can demarcate the boundaries. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I mean, you can logically... That, uh, if, if, even in what is called euchromatin, there are tighter regions and looser regions, right? So as... Uh, yeah, but I mean, you can um, you can guess what it can be. Uh, like, you, you know, what is the length of nucleosomal DNA, right? So if it is tightly wound, it can be maximum, it can come close, as close as 180 or something like that, 180. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, the reason I'm asking is like, uh, essentially, I want to understand if it's really binary or it's more of a, it's like, you really have a, this kind of a switch like mm. thing from going from you open chromatin to heterochromatin or there is some sort of a mixing or so on. I uh, there will be mixing, but it is not, um, I mean, you can still demarcate it quite well. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, does that uh, yeah, answer yeah, your you. question? Thanks. Yeah. Both of you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so if you uh, want to design epigenetic 
drugs, um, uh, better epigenetic drugs, what you need to understand is how um, these modifications are catalyzed in the cells. And uh, we currently we understand which chromatin modifying proteins actually are responsible for these modifications. But because epigenetic drugs are pan drugs, um, they we what we really need to understand is how these chromatin modifying proteins are recruited to particular sites in the genome. So because chromatin modifying proteins are present in all cell types, but they target different regions in different cell types because you to create the cell specific pattern. And uh, one of the new, how this is done is not entirely clear in case of many chromatin modifying proteins. And the new player in this um, whole dynamics is non-coding RNA or RNA in general and how are it, and the interaction between RNA and chromatin modifying proteins. And um, that's what we want to study, how RNA regulates chromatin modifying proteins and how it is involved in targeting these chromatin modifying proteins to the genome. Uh, so my lab basically works on RNA, uh, the interaction between RNA and epigenetics. And we basically are a mixed lab. We do more cell biology, transcriptomics, and computational biology. But basically, whatever it takes to answer our questions um, and um, where we cannot be we collaborate we collaborate a lot uh, with other people um, so um, this is just to give you a background why non-coding rnas are important and what kind of non-coding rna um, uh, uh, roles that we are interested in so one of the good examples of um, long non-coding rna that is involved in chromatin modification is um, uh, a non-coding RNA called EXIST. And this RNA is quite interesting. It has been studied by uh, labs for many years. And this is involved in something called as X inactivation. So as you know, um, that um, genetic females have two X chromosomes and uh, genetic males have X and Y. And X has X is a quite large chromosome. I mean, it has almost 5% um, of the genes, 5% um, uh, of all genes. And uh, Y is quite small. So it has like um, 100 to 300 genes. So um, this, the, if bo both X chromosomes are active, then you kind of have high dosage of genes, which are uh, in females, you will get high dosage of genes, um, double dosage of genes, uh, and quite a lot of genes, and that can create problems. So what uh, cell does is it inactivates one of the X chromosomes. And how this uh, chromosome is selected for inactivation is quite random. Which chromosome is selected is not quite um, well understood. But um, what is understood is when um, the inactivation happens, what happens is there is a locus on um, the chromosome which is going to be inactivated, X chromosome which is going to be inactivated called X uh, chromosome inactivation center. So that um, particular locus activates and then that leads to somehow suppression or um, heterochromatin formation in the rest of the X chromosome. Uh, and the way it is done, what is understood is that this X chromosomal inactivation center produces a non-coding RNA, um, which binds to repressive chromatin modifying proteins and then targets them to the rest of the X chromosome. And that's how the inactivation um, uh, takes place. So this is one of the quite interesting uh, example and really good prototype uh, of RNA chromatin modifying, um, modifying enzymes interactions. Um, so you, uh, yeah, one question, sure. so what are the typical time scales for like once you have this center is selected, then you start repressing the other genes, other parts of the chromosome. Like, what's what is the typical time scale for for? Um, it, it is quite quick. 
um, because um, you need you don't want this. I mean, this has to be um, done in quite a, during early development, right? Um, so it needs to be done quite quickly. I, I cannot tell you an exact time scale. Um, okay, but, thank you. Yeah. But I mean, there is a lot of literature on uh, access, um, yeah, and there are labs, uh, big labs, who have worked on access for years. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, it lot of these things are still not clear. Um, but I mean, what is clear is access is quite important in this. Um, um, yeah, okay, thank you. Thank whole you. process. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm just driving the point that non-coding RNAs are quite important, basically. Um, and um, so, so why do we study? So I have given you examples, uh, example of this um, particular non-coding RNAs. But why? What I really like to show in my talks is this uh, graph from John Maddox, uh, 2004 Nature Reviews. And um, this shows the percentage of uh, non-coding. Oh, sorry, uh, Aditya, Arijit, no, sorry, Ajay Subrahman says he has a question. Ajay, you can you can ask. Yes, uh, ma'am, can you go to your previous slide? Uh, yes, so the XIC is always present on one of the X chromosomes and it is randomly present. Is that true? Or yeah, so it depends on which chromosome this X inactivation center gets activated. Basically, from on which chromosome exist is um, okay. uh, expressed. So actually, but when... how that chromosome is selected is not entirely clear. Okay, so my question is: so when this uh, when this person uh, actually has mates and then. The, the progeny which is uh, resulting from that would then also have a randomly selected uh, the X, the inactivation center is not uh, uh, okay, it's not inherited. Okay. Yeah, and it is also, I mean, um, how should I, the, one of the good examples of this is this uh, Calico cat. Um, so uh, which has patches of different colors um, uh, on okay. the skin. So okay. that is a quite textbook example, actually, that really tells you that it is randomly selected because that particular gene which decides skin color, skin, uh, color uh, is present on X chromosome. So um, in some cells you have uh, the gene expressed, some cells you don't have, something like, something okay. like that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so basically um, th this tells you how um, the genome is, um, genome ha our genome has acquired non-coding um, non -coding regions and uh, basically it tells you over the period, like if you start from bacteria and go to, uh, it, it, in bacteria it is like 5%. Uh, of the genome, which is non-coding. But by the time you go to human, it is almost 98%. So 98% of the genome is, our 98% of the genome is non-coding. Um, and uh, the rest, the 2% codes for mRNAs, which code for proteins. And in the 98% non-coding genome, almost 75% is expressed into some form of RNA. So, I mean, we are always told the central, taught the central dogma that DNA uh, makes RNA, RNA makes protein. But actually, we need, this is not that central because 75% of the DNA actually codes for RNA that doesn't code for protein. And so far, we have been only um, um, concentrating on uh, the 2% of the genome, um, which is protein coding. So many years of research have, has gone in focusing on this 2% genome, um, while majority of the genome produces non-protein coding RNAs. And these non-protein coding RNAs actually rep represent, um, I mean, th there is so much unexplored um, data actually that can uh, that can be useful as biomarkers, targets, drug targets, treatments. Um, uh, but we haven't, we just don't understand a lot of these non uh, non coding RNAs. Um, I get the question. Um, so, 
it's also said that 50% of the human genome is repetitive uh, elements, right? So right. that means that a lot of these repetitive elements are also RNA coding genes. A lot of uh, repetitive um, genome also produces uh, produce non-coding RNAs. Uh, that's true. Right. Um, and um, I mean, non-coding RNAs. Some of these long non-coding RNAs are also spliced, so uh, they can pa form part of the processed RNA uh, or not. Um, it depends. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, repeats also produce non-coding RNAs. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then another important issue why uh, we should study this non-coding genome is to consider the fact that uh, there are a lot of disease-associated SNPs um, in the genome, uh, and most of the, uh, big, the re, uh, most of the studies are concentrated on uh, disease-associated SNPs in protein coding regions because that's what we understand. But there is a large percentage, um, almost 95%, obviously because we have so much non-coding genome is concentrated uh, in 95% uh, of these uh, disease associated SNPs uh, or single nucleotide polymorphisms are present in non-coding uh, genome. And they are all uh, linked to various various uh, diseases, as I've shown uh, on the right side. Um, although, I mean, some of them are obviously going to be just correlative, um, but we just don't know uh, the functions of, uh, are they functionally relevant or not? And non-coding RNA is kind of give an explanation uh, to these um, uh, diseases uh, associated variations in the genome. Um, so um, that is another reason why um, non-coding uh, RNAs are becoming important. So non-coding RNAs um, are classified in many different ways. So you know, uh, RNA, um, there are two forms of RNAs of mRNAs, which code for uh, proteins and other 75% non-coding RNAs. So some of these non-coding RNAs uh, you must have are well known. You would have studied um, during. Um, uh, they are all over in the books. Uh, so some, those are housecoping non-coding RNAs, which includes rRNAs, tRNAs, uh, SNO RNAs, and small nuclear RNAs. But there are other forms of regulatory non-coding RNAs. And they are divided based on the sizes. So generally, so this is quite random. Uh, but general uh, consensus is uh, we call small uh, non-coding RNAs which are less than 200 nucleotides as small non-coding RNAs, and those which are above 200 nucleotides as long non-coding RNAs. And uh, small non-coding RNAs are again quite well studied. You must have heard of microRNAs, sRNAs, spiRNAs. Uh, long non-coding RNAs, on the other hand, uh, they are also quite, I mean, now there are two, so many publications uh, coming out, uh, but we still don't have, because they do, they are involved in very different functional mechanisms. There is not a, a um, I mean, there is not a consensus model that can come up with these non-coding RNAs. So obviously they are much more difficult, but there is so much more to study in the case of these long non-coding RNAs. And uh, my lab uh, concentrates on these long non-coding RNAs or link RNAs as we call them. So they are further uh, divided based on how they are transcribed. So some are um, divergent uh, compared to protein coding genes um, and some are convergent depending on what direction uh, they are produced. Um, there are intronic long non-coding RNAs. So they uh, uh, are produced at, in the same direction as a protein coding gene. So here the yellow is basically a protein coding gene uh, and blue is non-coding RNAs. Uh, so they, they might be produced from the intronic regions. Um, and uh, there are many which are produced um, from intergenic regions um, between a different, uh, two different protein coding genes. Um, uh, and uh, then there are antisense RNAs, which are basically uh, transcribed from antisense direction to a sense uh, strand protein coding gene. And they can be um, 
divide and then there are sense um, non-coding RNAs which are transcribed in the same direction. Um, and they can be uh, organized in quite different way, but mainly the way we define antisense and sense non-coding RNAs is based on um, the fact that they are overlapping a protein coding chain. Um, so um, in my lab, there are three types of projects that are going on. One is RNA-centric, so where we uh, basically have looked at uh, individual non-coding RNAs, which, are, which we found interesting. And then we have gone on to knock down or knock out these non-coding RNAs to understand their functional mechanisms. Then we also look at protein proteins which interact with non-coding RNAs. Um, so we have projects where we have shown that uh, there are certain um, uh, non-coding RNA interacting proteins which can be present uh, in RNA binding form and RNA non-binding form. And that can have implications to gene expression regulation. Um, and then we have done, we are currently involved in a number of genome-centric um, projects where we are doing pan uh, knockdowns, basically uh, doing knock screens, genome-wide screens on these non-coding RNAs to uh, understand their functions. So one of the examples of these um, RNA-centric project is um, uh, based on RNA, which is, called, which is coded from chromosome 8 uh, uh, from a region, which is quite important in cancers. Um, so this region is um, a surrounding region to an um, oncogene called MYC. So you might have heard about MYC. MYC is quite popular in cancer field. And previously, uh, when we didn't know about these non-coding RNAs, when the next generation sequencing data was not out, um, what the MIC-related MIC um, MIC, uh, region looked like this. So you have MIC, um, and then there are there is one to to MB region around MIC, which had no gene, no protein coding gene, looked like a gene desert. But as the non, as the new annotations started coming out based on next generation sequencing data, uh, now the genome, uh, the surrounding region of MIC looks like this. And these are all non coding RNA, which are surrounding MIC. Um, so this is how the genome landscape has changed now because we have so much um, next generation sequencing data that has come out, which has changed our perception of lot of gene, a lot of genomic regions. Um, so, um, so one of the RNAs that we are working on is this RNA called CCDC26. So this RNA overlaps a disease-associated SNP hotspot. It is very peculiar because you have like hundreds of SNPs concentrated in this region. And this RNA is quite important in acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, and also uh, the whole region between MYC and CCDC26 is quite important in many different cancers. But when we started this work, functional mechanism of this RNA uh, was not known. Uh, you can hear me, right? Because everybody, Hi. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because everybody went quiet. There were a lot of questions, and there was suddenly a uh, uh, Hello. Uh, Hi. I just had a. Uh, I just had a question on this. Uh, this variants which you're seeing, uh, are they only from SNPs or do you also have alternate splicing? Because long coding RNA tends to have alternate splicing uh, happening. Uh, yeah, um, but this is, uh, we are, uh, here we were concentrating on disease associated SNPs. And in terms of alternative splicing, it is not really. Um, I mean, even this is associated SNPs, but uh, I mean, alternative splicing is common to um, everything, basically. Um, in case yeah. of non-coding RNAs, they are spliced, but they are not, um, the splicing pattern is not as well defined as in case of protein coding genes. So it is, that is quite difficult. It is not very well understood. Okay. 
Um, so, uh, so what we have done uh, is we have Chris. Can I can Hi. I ask you a question? So, yeah. Um, so, in the previous slide, so you are you? I mean, in some sense, you are thinking mostly that these non-coding RNAs that are close to the MIG gene, those are the ones presumably would impact MIG, but uh, or regulate MIG. But can't it happen that uh, like non-coding RNAs from other regions of the chromosome or other chromosomes even can come and impact them? Like. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, so we are not assuming th uh, that actually. Um, so I'm just showing this example to drive a point that uh, there are so many non-coding RNAs and we have missed out on this information. I see. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, it is true that there are uh, some of these non-coding RNAs are known to interact with MIC. Um, I mean, they regulate MIC. Um, and some of them are thought to be enhancer non-coding RNAs. Um, so, so that's a different topic. We wouldn't have probably time to go through it, but I can discuss with you later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, so basically, uh, here we, we are not we are not really uh, we were not assuming this, uh, and we didn't really find much effect on MEC. Um, so we. Uh, uh, use CRISPR uh, technology to knock out non-coding RNAs. So one of the other thing that uh, other point that I would like to make is uh, it's much more difficult to work on non-coding RNAs than protein coding genes. One of the reasons why, um, uh, I mean, there are not that many advances in the field because um, these non-coding RNAs are lowly expressed. Uh, some of the things like CRISPR-mediated knockouts are not that straightforward because uh, generally in case of protein coding genes, you target translational sites, start sites, which are very well defined. But transcription starts because non-coding RNAs don't have translational start sites. Not tra we have to target transcription start sites, which are not that well defined. Um, and um, other things like pull downs and all those things are also quite uh, challenging, basically. Um, but uh, we managed to get a CRISPR, uh, make a CRISPR knockout line for this non-coding RNA. And what we found was um, the um, knockouts grew uh, quite slowly and they were very apoptotic. Uh, they also showed DNA damage. Um, um, so um, generally, I mean, they didn't really like not, ha not having this non-coding RNA. And when, because we are quite interested in um, uh, epigenetic modifications, um, and because we, we knew that this non-coding RNA is, is nuclear, we started looking at different histone modifications. Uh, we also had RNA-seq data to show that the knockouts, um, a lot of genes were affected in the knockout. So we started looking at different histone modifications and DNA methylation. And what we found was, as you can see in this top figure, uh, that uh, DNA methylation was quite affected in these knockouts. Um, so DNA was quite hypomethylated in the knockout. And we have done quantitation of this by going and measuring uh, fluorescence at each uh, cell. Um, so um, one of my students actually painstakingly measured um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of um, um, cells actually, um, because she had to do ma this manually. Um, so she um, uh, basically- Aditi, can I ask you one more question? So how, yeah. how, how, how like, um, how, uh, like what's the abundance of its expression and typically like is it expressed at a very high rate or this particular non-coding RNA or because you say that it, it impacts many genes um so I, I yeah mean, but it is not I mean uh, it is not um proportional to that um so um it, it is it is better expressed than other um other non-coding RNAs, but if you compare it to, for example, gap TH, it is much, much less expressed. I see, thank you. Um, so, um, uh, so we, uh, we looked at um, the DNA methyltransferase enzymes and we found uh, with, I mean, one of the expectations we had was what these enzymes might be affected, the levels of these enzymes might be affected and this is an indirect effect. 
but we don't see any changes in um, the levels of these um, three enzymes that are uh, responsible for DNA methylation, maintenance of DNA methylation in the, um, in the human cells. Um, so um, what we did was we tried to see uh, somehow this, uh, the activity of uh, the DNA uh, methyl, um, methyl transfer is one, um, which is known to bind to RNA, um, is uh, affected and somehow it binds to this non-coding RNA as well by doing uh, something like if, uh, something called as RNA in a precipitation uh, where you are basically um, using, uh, it, it is just like um, other immunoprecipitation, but you are just pulling down the RNA with the interacting protein and then measuring its, measure, uh, measuring its levels in the uh, pull down basically. And we see that this RNA is quite enriched in the pull down, uh, which means that it interacts with the NMT1. Um, I mean, there is a lot of data in this, actually this paper is published now, um, but I, I am not going to go through this um, because I mean, Rahul asked me to concentrate on our recent gene, genome research paper. So I, I wanted to cover that as well. Um, so I, am, I have just kept uh, it as an overview, but it, you can ask me any questions later on. Yeah, no, I just said I was personally interested in that paper. But... No, I know, uh, but I, I just keeping the interest of the group, I thought. Um, it is fine. I, um, um, I mean, as I said, th this is just an overview of it. Uh, so we have a lot of experiments uh, which are done, but this is the story, basically, that uh, this RNA binds to DNMT1 and somehow um, it somehow is important for maintaining DNA methylation levels in the genome. And because uh, DNA, when we remove the RNA, DNA T1 is no longer able to do its function somehow. And that leads to um, DNA hypomethylation, which leads to genomic instability. Um, so uh, not... Um, many RNAs are shown to do this. Um, so we are quite excited about this and we are taking this forward. But so, so uh, Aditi, like, but isn't it based on the picture that the cartoon that you had? Um, mm. uh, so isn't it like you need um, a high abundance of these RNAs to bind to the proteins and then only the proteins can and this kind of complex can do the job? So um, you mean start uh, stoichiometry, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, but, I mean, you need to produce these RNAs in enough numbers so that they can go and bind to the proteins, and two of them together can impact. Yeah, um, but I, I, it is also possible that there are other non-coding RNAs. Um, I mean, oh. we haven't we have looked at global methylation, right? Mm -hmm. We haven't looked at we haven't done bisulfite sequencing or uh, to see where exactly the changes are. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so I have a general um, question. Um, hmm. So methylation is basically important only in vertebrates, and I think non-invertebrates uh, and other species also lack so much uh, non-coding RNAs. So is there some connection that the two evolved together um, because of these things you have methylation in the vertebrate genome? Just speculating. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we haven't really looked at um, in vertebrate. Uh, most of the work we do is on, in human cells, basically. Um, um, but I mean, as you, one of the advantages, uh, as I said, because we have gained a lot of non-coding RNAs as we, uh, I mean, as the genomes have evolved. So it is, some of the things are much easier in human cells. Um, like if, if we did this work on zebrafish as well, there are not many intergenic RNAs. And as I said, with CRISPR knockouts and all, it becomes quite difficult. Um, but it will be really interesting to see. Does yeah. that answer? That, that, did I understand what you were saying? Um, yeah, kind of. Like it was anyway a spe uh, speculative question More about common. evolution. Um, yeah. Co-evolution of methylation. Oh, okay, as a okay, 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 okay. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah, okay, a, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's possible um, because um, I mean there are not many chromatin. Uh, there are chromatin modifications. Um, there histone modifications are also uh, different. Um, so it is possible. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. I had one question. So yeah. the um, binding of the DNA methylase to the non-coding RNA, does it? Are we saying that it causes some modification of the protein, which doesn't allow it to perform its function of uh, methylation, or? I mean, mm-hmm. does it cause a structural modification or... So that's what we are guessing. I mean, one of, uh, there are many questions now uh, because the NMT1 is known to be a nuclear, um, nuclear protein. Uh, and it was when we saw this, actually, I didn't really believe. So that's why we did so many measurements, basically. Um, uh, but w- one of the things we see is that the NMT1 mi- is mislocalized. Uh, at least portion of it is mislocalized in the cytoplasm uh, in case of knockout. Okay. And so, we are trying to understand why that is ha- that happens. But DNMT1 is known to have these two domains uh, and they um, when it is not functioning or when, uh, when it is not involved in DNA methylation, uh, it is known that they fall onto each other basically. And the... Um, enzymatic center is not available. So I I mean, one of the theories I have is that it is possible that it does something to the structure. And um, that's why um, you see this mislocalization as well. Oh, thank you. Um, But it is quite difficult to study this because the RNA uh, is quite long uh, and the NMT1 is quite big protein with a lot of post-translational modifications. Um, So it is not experimentally that straightforward. I mean, if we want to do CDs and all those things are not uh, going to be possible for the whole protein. Okay. Also, sorry, one other question uh, was that when you say non-coding, do you mean long non-coding or do you are uh, I mean, yeah, long non We are mostly interested in long non coding um, RNAs okay. because small non coding RNAs are quite well studied. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the, there are, uh, excuse me, just the, yeah. there are the uh, modifications, for example, uridination and uh, hydroxymethylation. Uh, uh, has anyone looked at that or do you look at it uh, other than the methylation? Uh, other we haven't of uh, non-coding RNA. Um, we are not looking at modifications of non-coding RNA at the moment. We have plans to look at RNA modifications itself. We okay. are mainly looking at DNA uh, modifications, and as I said, because they, this has opened up so many questions, <laughs> that um, is going to be it is going to take us some time uh, to answer those um, given all the complications. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, so I'm just going to skip some of this thing quickly, otherwise uh, I wouldn't be able to um, finish the last part. Um, so basically uh, now we are moving into this. Um, so, so far we were concentrating one, one RNA on one, one RNA. Now we are moving to more um, genome wide uh, characterization of non-coding RNA. So one of the projects uh, we were involved, um, re- we were not active partners, but remotely involved with is Phantom Cons- Consortium. And uh, we were basically where uh, they um, use something called, um, uh, uh, they, they knock down um, a number of non-coding RNAs and then use, um, then phenotype uh, the knockdowns uh, using live cell imaging and cage sequencing, which is basically um, just uh, sequencing of five prime ends of the RNAs. And then they did cellular phenotyping and molecular phenotyping. But in my lab as well, we are extending this um, work to uh, do a large scale uh, genomic uh, screen of non-coding RNAs to identify those which are important in epigenomic modifications. Um, So again, uh, it is easier said than done. So currently we are setting up this, um, um, the pipeline um, and hoping that um, we will have a catalog of non-coding RNAs which affect epigenomic modifications. Um, So um, 
uh, other than, I mean, uh, we are mainly interested in how non-coding RNAs interact with chromatin modifications, and we haven't really restricted ourselves to one particular system. Um, so uh, one of the, um, so uh, we have studied this in multiple different, we are studying this in multiple different ways. And uh, one of the um, uh, studies that we recently did was in um, vertebrate development and uh, zebrafish development. Uh, and I mean, the non-coding RNAs are not, the functions of non-coding RNAs in these early developmental stages is not very well understood. You, have, you must have seen this kind of figure which shows how, highly conserved the early developmental stages are um, due in, in different vertebrates. Uh, and we also discussed about access. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it is highly likely that non-coding RNAs also play a part in these early developmental stages, but it, is, it has not been studied that well. Uh, and zebrafish um, it makes a really excellent model because it is, the embryos are transparent and it, develop so quickly that within 24 uh, to 48 hours, you have something that looks like fish. Um, so um, it, it is really um, uh, amazing to see you can actually monitor the uh, development um, quite well. So uh, with a collaborator in Birmingham, actually, we did this project. Uh, this was also part of a bigger consortium, actually. Um, so um, one of the interesting questions in early vertebrate development is um, how, the, uh, how the transcription is regulated. And uh, as you probably know that early in the early zygote, uh, most, of the, uh, most of the function is depend on, dependent on um, what is provided by um, maternal cells. So, um, so, and zygote itself doesn't produce any um, new transcripts. So the transcription uh, is switched off in zygote. And uh, in, initially everything is run on maternal RNAs um, and maternal proteins. And as the time, um, as the development um, happens, uh, what happens is maternal RNAs are degraded and zygotic genome is slowly activated and takes over the functions of the cells. And this uh, transition from maternal to zygotic um, um, uh, RNAs is quite important in the vertebrate development. Um, many uh, RNA binding proteins play a big role in this. Um, there are uh, small non-coding RNAs like microRNA 430, which plays quite important role in degrading the maternal RNAs. Um, but the, the transition between maternal to zygotic um, is not is quite uh, is relate. It's the, the the process is similar, but the timing of uh, this maternal to zygotic transition is quite uh, different in different organisms. So we started looking at this. Um, so uh, the consortium I was involved in uh, basically uh, was producing uh, um, um, ENCODE kind of um, genomic data during these early developmental stages in order to understand different questions in early vertebrate development. And in case of zebrafish, um, so I'm just showing this figure so that you will understand the next um, data basically. So uh, this is these are basically different stages um, um, in um, zebrafish development. And uh, this, this is the time. So the HPF means um, hours uh, post fertilization. And um, there are three waves of uh, maternal RNA degradation uh, and um, two waves of zygotic activation. And the actual um, uh, maternal to zygotic transition um, happens around three hours, uh, which is uh, called thousand, around thousand cell stage uh, or blastula. Uh, so, um, so, there was a paper in 2012 
from um, Alex Shear's lab, who uh, basically, they basically sequenced uh, RNAs during these early developmental stages. And this was, I think, the first uh, data set that was produced uh, during early developmental stages. But what was interesting was that they found that in uh, these early developmental stages, there is a lot, there are a lot of non-coding RNAs which are deposited uh, by, um, uh, the, um, by the egg and um, there are around, they identified around uh, 1,000 um, non-coding RNAs. Um, and they, I, I already mentioned about intragenic intronic non-coding RNAs. But what they found was um, the large majority of these non-coding RNAs fell in category of antisense non-coding RNAs. Uh, and uh, these non-coding RNAs, um, uh, otherwise looked quite similar. Most of the non-coding RNAs they had, except that they had, um, they were, as I said already, they, are, they were lowly expressed, uh, had low exon numbers. Um, and um, they also ca carried similar chromatin um, signatures as developmental genes, uh, indicating that they are quite important in the development. So that's what they found. Yeah. Yes. I see that Chandrasekhar has his hand up. Uh, Chandra, do you want to unmute? Aditi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, my question was, uh, during this transition from the maternal to the zygotic uh, uh, stage, are, is there a significant overlap between the ones that are being you know, uh, produced? I mean, as in, like, is it the same things that were used in the early stages of development that are now being... Uh, uh, what do you say, transcribed by the cell, or is it just uh, is, is a sort of trend for in general, just quantifying the mRNA that was just produced, or is it just specifically the cell starts producing the things that you know in uh, not so long back they were dependent on the maternal life? So it is actually, um, I mean, it is a mix of the two. Um, so if it is uh, like housekeeping genes um, are replaced. Um, from, uh, by the zygotic transcripts. So uh, the maternal housekeeping genes basically are uh, degraded and then uh, zygotic genes take over. Okay. Uh, okay. And one, one more thing, which is that... Uh, but there are other genes as well, like uh, tissue specific, because that is after that, uh, all the uh, tissue definitions and all those things start happening, right? So there are tissue specific genes which which are which start expressing um, from the zygotic genome as well okay uh, one one more thing which is that uh, typically mrnas are short you know have a shorter lifetime than like you know, proteins if i understand correctly and and they accumulate a lot of you know whatever uh, errors and stuff um, uh, as they spend more time. So, so you're saying the early stages of development, it's, it's a bit of a risk in the sense of, you know, you uh, if you rely entirely on the maternal RNA, you probably there's, uh, you know, uh, a certain amount of error, or is it just that, you know, you can rely on the early stages because there is enough time for it to correct for things that might actually, uh, for errors that might occur during, you know, the initial uh, very fast growth stage various is simply dividing um, up. Uh, what do you mean by errors? I mean, because these uh, um, basically, um, they are not transcribed, there's no transcription going on. So nothing new is no, but this, uh, Or think, you mean degradation? Kind yeah, of they, they get, still can get damaged, right? I mean, like, yeah. You know, um, I think uh, because um, my, I'm not a, a developmental biologist, but my understanding is uh, in these early stages, there's not much happening other than cell division. Um, and uh, what happens is your cell volume goes down initially. Okay. Um, so as the embryo, uh, zygote div divides, you basically, um, the cells become smaller. Okay, so it's basically more like a cleavage and not really proper cell division. It doesn't no, matter. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so there are uh, some, uh, questions in uh, related to uh, natural and uh, antisense RNAs, um, in which are not yet answered. Um, so the, the, one of the things is, is there are a lot of sense and um, antisense pairs. Um, either I forgot the 
percentages, but um, you, you should be able to find it um, somewhere. But it is quite high percentage um, that you see sense, um, antisense um, pairs in the genome. Uh, but when you look at, I mean, your natural um, um, logical reasoning would be that these pairs correlate somehow um, in terms of expression, given how transcription happens. But that is not what you see. Sometimes you see that these natural antisense uh, transcript or NATs, as we popularly call them, correlate, positively correlate with the sense strand protein coding gene. Sometimes they ne correlate negatively and sometimes um, they don't correlate. Uh, and it is possible that some of these actually uh, interact with genes which are somewhere else. Um, so people have tried to divide these NATs based on um, their uh, location vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the sense strand and see if there is a relation to sense strand expression just to solve this uh, question, if there is any particular relation that you should see between NATs and sense, sense strand protein coding gene. And... Um, uh, but uh, these attempts have not been very successful. You don't see any particular um, theme coming out of it. So um, we thought that we'll make use of this data, um, which is quite um, um, uh, temporal data, um, which is quite useful uh, for this kind of um, analysis. And what we did instead of uh, dividing them like previous papers based on their positions vis-a-vis, the sense strand uh, protein coding pair. What we did was uh, we um, um, we divided them based on their correlation uh, to the protein coding gene. So we uh, we picked up negatively correlated pairs, positively correlated pairs, and pairs with um, no correlation. And when we looked at the, when we plotted the expression. So I have shown here the average expression of um, uh, protein coding genes in this pair, um, these pairs, uh, protein coding genes and non-coding RNAs in these pairs. And what we see is um, that, um, so here I have shown MZT, which is um, a maternal to zygotic transition. And what we see is there is uh, the core, uh, in case of negatively correlated uh, pairs, you see a peculiar pattern. I mean, negatively correlated can be any way, right? But what we see is always the NATs are going down and the protein coding genes are coming up. Um, so, uh, and in positively correlated pair, there is a particular pattern. And I have shown here average um, um, expression patterns. But if we look at individual um, uh, pairs, you can see this as well. So majority of pairs do this. So the, one of the questions was, is it um, just because uh, maternal genes are um, being degraded during the develop early development? That's why naturally you see this kind of relation. So what we did was we paired these uh, natural antisense transcripts with um, neighboring gene rather than its overlapping gene, um, overlapping protein coding genes. And we see that we don't see the correlation uh, goes down in most of these cases. Uh, most, uh, I mean, uh, most of the cases you don't see any correlation. Um, and if you randomly pair them to protein coding genes elsewhere in the genome, then again, um, we don't see any correlation. So it, it doesn't look like it is random. Uh, and um, so what we decided was now that we have divided these uh, genes in these pairs, we can uh, look at if they show any particular characteristics, if each group shows any particular characteristics. So um, we uh, looked at different features. For example, in the first uh, instance, we looked at the overlap between these NAT, uh, anti antisense RNAs and protein coding gene. Um, and we see that um, uh, the, um, um, the, uh, the in negatively correlated um, group, we see uh, higher, um, higher um, overlap. If we look at um, the 
transcription to transcription start site distances, TSS, TSS distances. Then we see that the distances are also higher in case of um, this negatively correlated group compared to other two. And uh, this is this shows that the transcription start site of these antisense is further away from the transcription start site of overlapping protein coding gene. And um, same uh, thing we did with the um, transcription ends uh, and the distance between the transcription start sites of protein coding genes and the ends of antisense um, were not that significantly different to um, other groups, but uh, there as well, we see that this negatively correlated group is slightly different to the other, uh, other two groups. Um, when we looked at where these um, uh, different groups start in um, compared to the protein coding gene, we see that most of the group one that is basically negatively co correlated antisense RNAs um, start in the intergenic regions uh, neighboring to the protein coding gene um, overlapping it or its protein coding gene pair. Um, in case of um, um, uh, we also looked at if there is any uh, relation to the ends of these non-coding um, RNAs, uh, these antisense non-coding RNAs. And there is not a particular pattern that came out, but uh, in case of um, group one, they mostly ended in the intronic regions. Um, so uh, putting all these together, it looked like something, I mean, it is quite, these antisense RNAs are uh, variable, but general pattern that came out of this was um, the negatively correlated group basically starts in the intergenic region um, neighboring to the protein coding gene. And um, it is the it starts for this compared to other uh, two groups. And um, it generally ends in uh, um, uh, in an intronic region with uh, uh, quite high overlap compared to the other two. The positively correlated group starts quite near the transcription start site compared to, not, I wouldn't say quite near, but uh, compared to the group one, it starts quite, um, in, in starts nearer. Um, and then uh, there was, we looked at chromatin modification patterns at these uh, overlapping mRNAs. Uh, and we see there are, they are quite distinct, distinct between group one and group two. Uh, so group one mRNAs, uh, basically here I have shown uh, H3K4ME3 is basically, I mean, that's the usual nomenclature for histone modifications, if you don't know. Um, so H3 is for histone 3, uh, K4 is lysine 4, um, and ME3 is trimethylation. So it is um, trimethylation of uh, lysine 4 and histone 3, and same way uh, lysine 27 methylation. So this H3K27 methylation, uh, this particular histone modification is um, much more pronounced in group 1. And the interesting part is um, that this particular histone modification is quite, um, uh, it's always found at developmental genes. So it is a peculiar um, mark on developmental genes um, and which is catalyzed by something called as polycom proteins, which are quite important in development. So it looks like, it looked like group one, uh, these negatively correlated um, pairs uh, or negatively co correlated mRNAs are actually developmentally important mRNAs. And uh, they are, um, when we looked at gene ontology, we can also see that they, they have, um, the, the, the multicellular organism development is a term which is quite uh, highly significant in case of um, this group. So it looked like this, these group one um, um, antisense RNAs are quite important in regulating developmental genes. Um, so, um, so another thing we did in addition to mining the previous data is we produce our own data using um, um, to total RNA seq, which is which includes poly A plus, which is mRNA and poly A minus, which are which generally populate native RNAs, and 
non-coding RNAs. And uh, we uh, kind of divide, uh, we fractionated the cells during early development into nuclear and cytosolic fractions. So it is one of its kind data that we have produced here, which is not available for um, uh, this uh, during these early developmental stages. Um, so um, we use this data um, to understand if these group one NACs are cytosolic uh, or nuclear, because that would tell us if they are directly involved in um, driving the histone polycom related histone modifications. But um, what we surprisingly see was um, saw that was that these uh, group one uh, non-coding RNAs are mostly cytosolic. So here, what you see is basically blue color is nuclear and red color is cytosolic. So they are, at least in initial stages, they are cytosolic, which goes with um, the fact that they are deposited, uh, they are maternally deposited RNAs. Um, but group two is relatively more nuclear, basically. Um, but we are uh, digging into this data even more further uh, in a follow-on study, basically. Uh, so we also have uh, something called as caged data uh, on low cell number, um, which is also quite um, deeply sequenced data, uh, which is going to be useful for this study. So what we think is uh, that developmental genes are actually, uh, some of these developmental genes are actually switched off in the, um, in the early uh, genome. And... Um, but if there is any spurious um, transcription that is going on from zygotic genome, that might be quite detrimental for the early development. And what these group one um, NATs um, do, because they are cytosolic, they must uh, be, uh, they have, uh, we, what I didn't show was they have some sequence similarities with the uh, overlapping genes. So what we think is it is possible that they are involved in something similar to uh, microRNA where they um, bind to the um, developmental um, mRNA, uh, which is furiously uh, expressed and help to degrade them. And that's how keep, uh, it's kind of a safe mechanism, basically, safety mechanism. Um, so yeah, so sorry, I have um, gone over the time, uh, but I, I mean, it was glad that you, yeah, I'm just finishing. Um, so yeah, so we are now involved in number of, we are extending this to number of um, other projects where we are looking at um, non-coding RNAs in um, aging relate, age related cancers like B-cell lymphoma. Um, then uh, also involved, uh, I am part of this adverse drug reaction center here um, uh, where we look at, we are analyzing the uh, genome variations in uh, drug response and how non-coding RNAs might explain that basically and also uh, in stress response, if we can, uh, we are trying to basically uh, annotate RNAs during stress response. So, uh, so far we have done a lot of um, um, basic mechanism kind of work, uh, but we are slowly moving into um, more application oriented work because I mean, uh, we have now collaborations with a lot of clinicians actually, um, so, uh, which is, uh, that's how it seems like we are moving to. Um, and um, I mean, I have had pleasure of, I mean, I, my PhD students have been really excellent and other people in the lab and my postdocs, like um, who is actually setting up this um, uh, genome wide screen and a number of great collaborators and my, funding bodies. I am really thankful to them. So sorry again that I have gone over the... Well, there's no issue about uh, this like going over and thanks again for a very nice talk. Um, there have been quite a few questions during the talk and we have time for a few more if anybody else wants to ask anything. 
it's really good. I mean, so so many questions actually. I really enjoyed. Arjit has his hand raised. Arjit, please unmute. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, I was uh, wondering, uh, what are your plans for drug toxicity? So you're trying to see how drugs, um, administration of drugs, uh, would uh, change the expression of the non-coding RNAs or something beyond that. Uh, so we have, um, uh, as part of this center, actually, we have access to um, data base, databases where a particular kind of population, um, I mean, genomic changes like SNPs are correlated to certain drug responses. Uh, but many of these genomic changes, like uh, many SNPs, which are associated with drug, uh, how people re respond to drugs, um, are in the non-coding um, regions, and it is quite difficult to explain uh, their um, functional significance, basically. Let me ask. And we. Let me ask a follow-up. So. So these are drugs which are people are taking over time, like lifestyle drugs, like diabetes, or uh, like I mean, there are some drugs you take seldom, and then there are some drugs you live on. So when you are talking of SNPs uh, related to the drug uh, drug use, so uh, these are some specific type of drugs. Uh, just uh, it is a mix basically, um, but I mean um, the main thing is. Um, here in Liverpool, they have had a very big study. I mean, um, where they 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 showed. Um, I mean, it, it is often seen that if some of the people are much more sensitive to certain uh, drug dosages, uh, it it is both actually. Um, um, it, I mean, even things like aspirin and all. Um, so there are uh, people who respond to drugs um, much they're much more sensitive basically uh, and lot of uh, it is quite important field in the drug design as well because a lot of drugs get thrown out in the pipeline because of the uh, toxic reactions basically so the, the this is quite important to understand basically but the genomic variation related to the, these uh, drug sensitivities and toxic reactions are real. Um, are, a lot of them are concentrated in non-coding genome. One last question. I'm sorry, I'm taking more time. No, uh, no. So, uh, the, is it limited to approved drugs or is it clinical drugs? And is this the uh, data that is available which you have access to, is it uh, limited to just drugs or could be also environmental chemicals? Um, we are not looking at environmental chemicals, but this can be, you can imagine that this can be extended to anything, basically, really. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Yeah, let me just say, uh, Arijit is uh, a colleague at Math Science, and he has done a lot of work on environmental chemicals and uh, oh, okay. so on. So I think uh, maybe you two should talk a little bit afterwards. Yeah, after we, we can, uh, I mean, we can arrange a Zoom later on if you want. Um, and I can give you more details about this. Thank you very much. Um, so Lilavati has her hand up. Uh, you can unmute and ask. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was just wondering about these, um, the antisense, the NAT, the last part that you spoke about, whether mm -hmm. um, um, instead of NATs, if you look at protein coding genes, do you see a similar relationship or there is no such relationship between antisense protein? You, you see what I'm saying, right? Yeah, pairs I, I understood. Pairs. You mean pairs of protein coding mm. genes, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, that was, I think, one of the things our reviewer had asked. And this uh, random pairing and all those things also came out of those um, comments, basically. So we have looked at it. I don't think we have seen the same relation. I see. And, and what I... Is there an explanation of why I didn't quite? Did, did you mention? It? I don't know uh, if I missed it. Why, why there is there? Yeah. Um. A, I mean, this is very computational uh, genome anal genomic analysis study actually, um, and we want to do functional analysis. 
the issue as i said there are a lot of um, things that are easier said than done for example in case of antisense rna um we need to if you we want to for example do um crispr kind of study um then um we do i mean you need to choose the antisense rna carefully so that you are not mutating the overlapping gene which just, becomes uh, much just more think, complicated right right no i understand the experiments are going to be hard but just theoretically mm. why uh, that distance can be a factor i mean it's a, it's a very, a very unusual thing to look for and I'm, i mean i would not have thought of looking at the overlap <laughs> you know of between the yeah uh, i think it is i mean if i have to guess um I've based on what we know in the field uh, i think it is pro- probably um i mean in case of positively correlated for example they are quite near um, might be because of opening like i was talking about this polycom modifications right so mm-hmm. if you switch off the promoter um i mean that's a logical reason right if you switch off the protein coding promoter because of the chromatin modifications it will switch off if your non coding rna is also quite nearby it will switch off that one as well just just based on open chromatin heterochromatin thing mm. as well um right. so that is i mean I- independent of antisense rna uh, it is thought that um lot of um genes which are ex- expressing genes actually have some kind of antisense transcription going on just because i think polymerase does this right 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 yes that's good yeah. okay thank you thank you okay thanks so just to say lilavathi is from isaac pune and is uh, very much interested in like many of the same things that you talked about so maybe you can set up a zoom call to afterwards if you are interested in Yeah. Um, any more questions here? If not, uh, yeah, we have 15 minutes over time, so let's thank Aditi again, and uh, yeah, um, thanks for joining everybody. I learned a lot. Thank you. Uh, it was a really good chat with, and uh, I mean, so many questions. I really enjoyed it. Uh, if anybody wants to have a chat separately, uh, feel free to contact me, and we can set up a Zoom. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Bye.